All right, so uh, welcome again for uh, to the com communication signal processing seminar. Um, so first, I wanted to thank our sponsors, KLA, and the two research groups, um, Network Communication Information Systems and Signal Image Processing and Machine Learning. I also wanted to thank uh, Shelley Falcam, who's been the workhorse behind this whole thing to make sure everything works fine. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm delighted to have um, Adam Weirman from Caltech be our speaker today. I've known Adam for a fairly long time. So I, once I introduce him, I'll give you a few tips as to how he um, does what he does. <clears throat> so he's a professor in the Department of Computing and Mathematical Sciences, CMS of the California Institute of Technology. He's also the director of the Information Science and Technology Initiative and serves as the executive officer, basically the department chair of CMS. Uh, from 2015 to 2020. Uh, he received his PhD, MSc, and BSc in computer science from Carnegie Mellon University in 20, uh, 2007. Sorry. Uh, that was his PhD, 2004 was his MSc, and 2001 was his BSc. And he's been a faculty at Caltech since 2007. Now, Adam's research strives to, be, to make network systems that govern our world sustainable and resilient. He's developed uh, new mathematical tools in machine learning, optimization, control, and economics, and applies these tools to design new algorithms and markets that can be deployed in data centers, electricity grid, transportation systems, and beyond. Um, <clears throat> he's best known for his work spearheading the design of algorithms for sustainable data centers, which led to significant industry adoption and was named a Computer World Honor, Honors Laureate. He is a recipient of multiple awards, including the ACM Sigmetric Rising Star Award, the um, IEEE Communication Society, William Bennett Prize, and NSF Career Award, and multiple teaching awards. He's also a co-author on papers that have received best paper awards at various uh, variety of conferences across computer science, power engineering, and operations research, including ACM Sigmetrics, IEEE Infocom, IFIP performance and IEEE PES. So one thing you would have noticed with Adam is he's not, um, so he's sort of involved in lots of communities and in, uh, including applied probability operations research, theoretical computer science, uh, the algorithmic game theory community. He's also done work in sort of in the choice models and uh, economics, energy systems and, um, and also online um, connex optimization learning. Uh, so you would wonder how he can stay, uh, keep all this together. So I would say that he, uh, I also know that he's a fantastic runner as well. So I think he sort of tries to stay ahead of the game. I think uh, if I'm not mistaken, was it a five minute uh, mile or is it, what is your time? Like, I don't know what your best time is. <laughs> not what it used to be. <laughs> no, of course not now. At but some point. <laughs> so that, I think using all of that. Um, I think it was four, but <laughs> not for a long time. <laughs> So he's able to stay ahead of the game and um, and and actually be leading in all of these things that he's involved in. And with that, I'll lead the uh, round to um, Adam. Go ahead. Thanks, PJ. Uh, thanks. It's uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I know we were. I, I was supposed to come. Uh, a while ago, and you know, with the with the way the world turns, uh, it's been a little bit of a delay. But it's great to get this chance to talk to everybody. And I've been enjoying my meetings this morning so far, and uh, I look forward to meeting with some more people tomorrow uh, after the talk. Um, so, I this is uh, you know what I'm talking about today is going to be a, a sort of more specific project around competitive control and online optimization. But I wanted to start by uh, you know, thinking about, oh, sorry, let me get the focus on me. I wanted to start by uh, just giving a little bit of a broader context for why we're working in this area and uh, in particular, all the excitement growing around learning and control today. So, so learning, learning and control is an interface that's really uh, kind of been driven by all of these, you know, things that we hear about all the time in the news, you know, uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, you know, robots interacting with people in hospitals in, in sort of uncertain environments, drone delivery and other sort of control problems around that. And, you know, the one that I'm closest to here is, you know, smart grids and the sophisticated kind of combination of learning and control that's being used to integrate renewables, uh, electric vehicles, storage, and all of these other things. Um, 
And, you know, we see all the time, you know, how all of these things seem to be right around the corner or even arriving today. Uh, but, you know, these are really challenging uh, problems that, you know, just throwing uh, vanilla off the shelf machine learning on top of, uh, you know, doesn't solve doesn't solve at the end of the day it's, it's not enough uh and you know so realizing the potential of these things you know the promises that people are making around these things is proving to be quite a challenge you know the predicted arrivals of autonomous vehicles uh have long since passed i really like this headline from wired around old promises broken from elon musk and, you know so he makes new ones and i think the current pledge uh, that he makes is that we'll have full real autonomous on autonomous vehicles in 2020 but I you know, fully expect that will be updated soon since clearly we're missing that deadline. But he's on, I think, promise number three or four and many others fall into the same boat where you know, all of these things seem to always be arriving right around the corner. But the reality is uh, when things get deployed, uh, spectacular failures are common, whether they be crashes or you know, demos of these robotics, uh, things you know, not working as well as the cherry picked video that gets, uh, you know, goes viral on YouTube. Uh, drone crashes when we're trying to do deliveries and and for you know the big systems that you know the real large scale problems like the blackouts that we saw in California when you know control control structures did not kick in the way they were designed to uh, in response to fires or uh, you know solar black solar uh, either being underperforming or overperforming and creating challenges for the grid uh, and so you know I think you know in all of these things what we really need is a combination of integrating learning into control that gives us scalable, trustworthy, predictable control. And we're just not there yet. Um, and, you know, people wish we were there and maybe make over promise uh, about how close we are. But, but actually, there's a lot of really interesting research that's going into trying to get there. Uh, and in particular, there's really a, an emerging uh, community around the interface of learning and control. Uh, that has grown quite a bit in the last few years. And uh, there's a, a major conference now, Learning for Dynamics and Control, L4DC, uh, that will have its third iteration uh, this winter. And you know, there's uh, workshops. There have been many. The IPAM one is shown on the screen, but there's been a lot of other work, uh, sort of high profile workshops around the interface of learning and control in the last two years. Uh, and you know, to do a little bit of promotion for something that was born at Caltech, there's a, a new seminar or a new virtual seminar series uh, with weekly talks every Wednesday at this interface uh, that we hope everybody will join uh, uh, and talk. And you know, we had our second. We have had two talks in the series so far from Elad Hassan and Babaka Sipi, and uh, the next one will be in two weeks on Wednesday. So uh, you can join the Google group there if you're interested in this area. Uh, but I think there's just an enormous amount of work coming out in this uh, sort of in this interface, and and it really does span you know the typical control venues in IEEE and CDC and ACC with the high profile learning venues like NeurIPS and ICML and AI Stats and others places like that. So on both sides, there's huge excitement uh, around this area, and you know I think rightfully so. There's there's really a complementary philosophy. Uh, in these communities, where when you think of machine learning, uh, you you know you're taking data to action in this model-free way, and we've seen huge successes from that over the years uh, in control. The perspective of going not from data to action, but from model to action, uh, and really building detailed models that we can do control based on is really powerful. I mean, that's what got us to the moon. Uh, that sort of perspective. Uh, and you know these are different, but they're they're very related, and it's you know really kind of natural to say how can we combine the model free and model based approaches uh, to get a best of both worlds? How can we combine the idea of mitigating uncertainty by learning from past data with the idea of mitigating from uncertainty via the feedback uh, to our current action? So sort of the future data to come. Uh, these are sort of very complementary views that if we can find ways to combine them should yield you know, significant improvements in scalability and reliability and all of this uh, for our control systems. Uh, and so I think you know, the potential is really there and you know, the philosophies really match, but you know, the research in this area has really been about how do we achieve that? How do we get to the best of both worlds by combining these philosophies? Um, and I think you know, at this point there are a number of kind of 
clear research directions that have emerged in the community. Uh, I'm going to give three here. These are clearly not all inclusive, and and I'd say it's it's my personal bias in some sense because these are the three that we've spent the most time on uh, in my group at Caltech as well. Uh, but I think you know these are much more broadly interesting than just you know what's been going on in our group. There's a huge literature of work building around each of these questions. Um, and the first one I think is the most obvious, right? When you when you take you know machine learning and you try to combine it with control, the most natural thing to do is to say we have all this you know predictive control uh, that we spent decades developing, and uh, control theorists have spent decades developing, and you know things like model predictive control. And can you use the machine learning you know, the data to action viewpoint to build the predictions that these sorts of traditional control policies will use. And if you do this in the right way, maybe this allows you to extend uh, you know, those sorts of policies to places where they've been difficult to uh, you know, use before in time-varying environments where there's model error, where there's delayed observations. Maybe you can get more robustness through these sort of MLAI predictions and integrating them into sort of the control systems that, that we're used to. And there's a huge amount of work uh, along those lines that's happened in the last few years. Uh, another direction that I say is kind of, you know, and very natural and, a, and a sort of an obvious one when you combine these is, you know, the machine learning community has a very different perspective on the type of results and the type of analysis that it does, which is more focused around robustness and efficiency rather than stability. Uh, and so, you know, things like adversarial analysis, regret analysis, finite time bounds, single trajectory bounds uh, are really powerful things that when we bring the, that perspective into control, hopefully allows us to improve the robustness and efficiency. And there's been a ton of work around that direction, uh, especially with regret analysis of control policies uh, over the last few years. Um, and then the third one is maybe the most, you know, the, the most important and the biggest, but also the hardest to quantify, which is coming back to this idea of, you know, the model free and the model based perspectives are really different and complementary. And combining them is, is an obvious goal, but hard in the details. And you know, in some sense, combining them boils down to the idea of how much do you need to understand in terms of like model uh, about a system to be able to control it? Can you model less and be more model free to handle, you know, to get sort of this efficiency gain and these improvements that uh, you know, model free approaches like reinforcement learning have provided in lots of other contexts? Uh, but you don't want to go too far because then you lose the guarantees that the model provides about stability and other things. So how do you kind of find that right, that right balance about what you need to understand uh, about the model to, in, order, in order to control it? And can you get scalability, scalability and robustness uh, from combining these things, uh, from combining the model-based approach with things like model-free reinforcement learning? Uh, and so I think, you know, a lot of the community and the interface of learning and control can be sort of put into these three buckets if you squint a little bit. Uh, and, you know, I think these are really great driving questions for the community going forward. Uh, in terms of our work at Caltech, we have, we have bits of work on all three. And, you know, the focus of what I'll talk about for the most part today is around these first two, really a lot the second one, how do you take you know, the ML tools around robustness, around adversarial analysis and, and these sorts of approaches and get robustness and efficiency for control out. But I'll talk a little bit about predictions as well. Um, but we have also done work on the model free and model based that I think is really excited. It's just really brand new. And uh, so I only want to give you a, a teaser for it here before I get into the, the main body of the talk. So this is uh, joint work with a number of people. Uh, and we have, I'd say, two projects that really have just come out. Uh, or even just about to be submitted uh, in this area that I want to highlight. So, so one, you know, and this will give be a little bit more concrete about what I mean by can we combine model-free and model-based approaches. So the first one is uh, in the multi-agent reinforcement learning context. And here, the the situation is, you know, think about you have a network, a communication network, or a power network. The example, the figure here is for a wireless multi-axis wireless network. And you have a bunch of distributed agents, and you want these agents to learn local control policies. Uh, so how do you use you know, multi-agent RL for them to learn local control policies? If you just apply it off the shelf, scalability is a huge problem. You have exponential uh, you know, complexity in terms of the number of agents and the size of the network and all of these things. Uh, and so what, how do you get around that? It's been a, it's been a big challenge for the area. Uh, and we have been able to sort of give the first uh, scalable, provably scalable, 
uh, provably convergent multi-agent RL bounds for network systems. And, and actually the approach that we use to do that goes through studying Q learning and TD learning with state aggregation. Uh, and so the, the techniques that we use to do this also give the first finite time analysis for Q learning uh, and TD learning with state aggregation. Um, and so I think you know, that's something that's really exciting and gives you an idea of how we can combine model-based and model-free because we're taking the model of the network, the model of the interactions, and using that, to, you know, that property to give scalability to the multi-agent reinforcement learning where without that model, everything would have exponential complexity. Um, another example to sort of highlight how we're approaching kind of this question is to study nonlinear control. Uh, and so here we're looking at, you know, control of nonlinear systems. The example here is an inverted pendulum, uh, but in general, just think of a linear dynamical system with a nonlinear term added to it. Uh, and the idea here is, you know, if that nonlinear term is present, but not too big. So for example, think of the like linear model as a good approximation of the nonlinear model, uh, then you can use LQR as sort of a warm start for model free methods. Uh, and improve LQR via the model free methods and get very uh, big improvements in the final policies in terms of their sample complexity and the number of iterations you need. And so the plot shows this where the blue line is the, uh, you know, a model free approach. Uh, the red line is, or the black line is the uh, LQR, so the model based approach where you ignore the nonlinearity and just use the linear system. And, you know, we kind of start from that, but improve with a model free RL approach. Uh, and, you know, get uh, just something better than either one individually, right? The best of both worlds, where we tune to the data uh, in a very efficient way, uh, much more efficient than the model-free way, because we take advantage of the structure that, uh, of the linear approximation. Uh, and so this, this approach should work generally. We're looking now at how to extend it to other models where you just have an approximation of the dynamics and you're able to start from that approximation and use a warm start. And then you get provable convergence guarantees as long as that approximation is good enough in some sense. And so here, you know, this, this result, we, I think uh, it's the first provably convergent policy for uh, policy gradient method for nonlinear control. Although, you know, I don't want to overstate here, it's nonlinear control where there's a linear approximation that's good enough. That's the key thing to, that makes it work is you're taking advantage of the model structure. Um, so this is all I'm going to say about these. So maybe it's a good chance if, if someone's really interested in these and wants to ask me a quick question about these two things, I'm just trying to give a little bit of a teaser on them to point you to the papers. And I just want to say Guanan uh, here in the red circle is the lead author here on these work. Uh, he's a postdoc. He'll be on the job market this year. If, if anybody wants to invite him uh, to their group to give a seminar on either of these papers, uh, he has some slides ready to go and, and would be very happy to do it, I'm sure. So does anybody want to ask me any questions about these two before I go on? Okay, uh, I'll keep going then. I mean, I'm, I'm open. Oh. To, I'm looking at the chat. There are no questions yet. But... Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so yeah, and, and please, I don't mind uh, unmuting and asking questions here. I think, uh, I think we're all used to this environment now, so we can do that and, and keep it reasonably uh, contained. Um, okay, so, so that was a teaser on the third one, but what I, I, like I said, I want to focus on the first two uh, today and in particular look at something that has been kind of an obsession of mine for quite a while now, which is uh, algorithms for online optimization and in particular building a connection between online optimization, which is typically looked at in the learning community and uh, uh, control, adaptive control. Uh, and so what do I mean by online optimization? Here, here's a you know, one-dimensional cartoon that I like to use to explain why, you know, what, what's going on in this problem. So, so think of you're, choosing, you're making selections of an action from an action space. And so X's are your actions. And you're starting at some point. And then you're presented with a cost function each round. And your goal is to minimize that cost function in the round with your action. And so if, if it were as simple as that, you would just jump directly to the minimizer. But you pay not only a hitting cost for your cost on the cost of your action on that cost function, but you also pay a switching cost or a movement cost for how far you moved from x0 to x1. Uh, and so this is a type of online optimization with switching costs or smooth online uh, uh, convex optimization. And so the switching cost is key because it means that you have to kind of, you know, anticipate somehow what's going to happen in the future to decide whether it's worth it to make a move. 
And so, you know, this continues, you get a new cost function then in the second round, you make a new choice for your action, you pay the cost on that and you pay your movement. Then you get a third one, you make a new choice, you pay the cost, you pay that movement cost and so on. And so, you know, here, if we look back at this, uh, you know, what we did was kind of fairly myopic. We always moved pretty close to the minimizer of each function. But if we had had foresight, we could have done better because uh, we could have just moved to, you know, somewhere between X1 and X3 and stayed there for the next three rounds and done very well. We would have been at the minimizer here. We would have been a little off for the minimizer in the second one, but not very much at all. And then we would have been at the minimizer for the third one. So we would have avoided taking this move out and back for X2, which would have saved us a lot of cost if we had known we were gonna come back. And so the fundamental challenge in this kind of online optimization with switching cost is how do you decide whether it's worth it to switch, whether it's worth it to go to the minimizer or close to the minimizer, given that you don't know what the future costs are gonna be. And so you don't know whether you might have to jump back and kind of pay extra switching costs for very little gain. So that's that's the fundamental like algorithmic online question that you have to answer when you're designing algorithms for this context. And so you know, just summarizing that on one slide, you have uh, your uh, actions where you see a cost, you make a choice, see a cost, make a choice, see a cost, make a choice, uh, and then you have your cost over the horizon of your hitting costs. Uh, you're always choosing from actions, some action set. Think of both of those as convex in in most cases, and then you have a switching cost, which is, you know, it could be a norm or it could be something more general, potentially, uh, that, car, yeah, that penalizes you for your movement. And so this has been sort of called smooth online convex optimization or, or online convex optimization with switching costs. And you're trying to do well here with respect to what someone with foresight could have done. So the competitive ratio is the most common metric, I'd say. Uh, and the uh, here, you know, one of the two most common metrics actually. So, uh, and the competitive ratio is comparing you with what the offline optimal could have done. So if the offline optimal knew what was gonna come and could pick the full trajectory of actions, how well could it have done? You wanna try to do as close to that as possible and being within a multiplicative factor is the goal. Uh, being within a constant multiplicative factor is the goal. So Adam, uh, I had a question on the yeah. uh, sort of, in this context, I mean, so you, the offline optimum is sort of computed knowing all the CTs afterwards. You know. Yep. But um, I mean, is it so? One of the challenging things, I guess, is if I were to take that that sequence, maybe the adversary would throw some other functions at me, right? Yeah, exactly. So it's it's not clear a priori that you can do well here because you know you you have an adversary that can adapt to your choices, and so if you make a big move, they can make you suffer for that. Uh, and so it's really, you know, it is a very challenging question, right? If we go back to this example, if you hadn't moved to X2, uh, maybe all of the functions then would have been X, at X2 and you would have suffered a lot by not making that move and sticking where X1 and X2 were. So it's really, you know, the adversary can punish you either way, whether you make a move or whether you don't make a move. And so it's not clear a priori that, you know, having a constant bound for a competitive ratio here is possible. Um, it's a it's a challenging problem. Um, and then there's the, another question in oh, the audience, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Narada, if you want to make put your question, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, Adam. So I was wanted to, wondering that uh, you are in the setting of the Zinkevich paper, right? Uh, with additional switching costs. Yeah. So the, so the key thing here compared to like the classic learning online convex optimization is this switching cost. Uh, and that's, that makes the problem a lot harder. And you'll see that that's crucial to the connection to control. So without the switching cost, it's kind of just, can you estimate the, the cost function ahead of time? And so you tend to think about the cost function not being known precisely or only getting sort of limited feedback of it. And that's where the hardness comes from. Here, this is hard, like the way, the way I'm introducing it, you get to observe the cost function. And so in some sense, it's easy without the switching cost because without the switching cost, you could just, you know, jump right to the minimizer every time and be optimal. Uh, but the switching cost adds, a, adds the complexity. And so I'm highlighting really that the, the switching cost is the hardness here. Um, also, also, is it a, a you know, adversary setting that you have a min-max type of behavior? Or yeah, a... so that's true. So competitive ratio, we're thinking completely adversarially. We do have results, results in sort of stochastic models too, but for the talk, just think of everything as adversarial and just to keep it simple. Um, so ju just a clarification question. 
Yeah. What's the difference between offline optimization and static optimization? One is min max, one is given. Yeah, so that's what I was just going to say now. So, so regret is the other measure, and you know, since uh, uh, I think a lot of people here are expert in that, so regret is thinking of the offline optimal, but not a dynamic choice of x. So you choose one x, uh, and you're stuck with that the whole time. Whereas the offline, op the true offline optimal will have a different x for each action. So, so regret typically looks at you know the best case static choice you could have made, you know, static policy you could have chosen in, in retrospect having known the cost functions, whereas the competitive ratio is comparing against the true offline optimal that is can be dynamic. And so regret is common in learning because, you know, you're learning an optimal policy and you're going to play that optimal policy. If you think of control, it's competitive ratio that is much more relevant, I think, uh, because you're wanting to react in a dynamic way to all of the choices. Um, but also, you know, this is what I, when I say just when I limit regret to static optimal, there are lots of notions of dynamic regret also, where you kind of go and you consider a policy class that allows some degree of dynamic choices. And so, uh, so regret can be defined, you know, for different policy classes. This is just the most classic notion of regret that uses the pure static optimal choice. Does that make sense? Yes, thanks. Perfect. One more clarification question, please. Awesome. Can I quickly go. ask a clarification? Yeah, go question, for it. Please? Yeah, go so it. it seems that you're having a time varying CTs. Are there any restrictions on these functions? Nope. So we'll, we'll end up adding some later, but for now, nope. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and they're completely adversarially selected. Um, okay, good. So excellent. Thank you for the questions. That helps a lot. And so uh, we already got the, the question here about offline versus static. And you know, that's an important thing. And I'm, I'm, making, I'm taking the extreme version of regret so that I can make this contrast as, uh, as clear as possible, where you're comparing the dynamic optimal solution to the static one where you're choosing a, a fixed x. Um, OK, so we, just to give motivation for why we got interested, because we actually have been working on this problem for a long time in my group now. We got interested because of sustainable data centers. Uh, and asking the question of, you know, can a data center run entirely on renewable sources, uh, which on its surface seems, you know, blatantly false, like there's no way it could happen. Wind is unpredictable. Each, you know, solar is unpredictable and highly variable. And, you know, these plots are, are very typical in this area to show this. Uh, it shows, you know, the same location, the energy output on different days in, this, in a given month. So the x-axis here is 24 hours and each line is a different day. Uh, you see there's huge variability across days and in very unpredictable ways. And so how could you run you know, a data center entirely with such variable sources? Uh, you'd have to adapt the capacity with dynamic right sizing. You have to defer workloads to when you have energy available. For example, solar isn't always available. And so it depends on being able to kind of inf in, in, uh, implement the infrastructure to do that and having workloads that are uh, you know, can tolerate this kind of deferral or having a reasonable fraction of workloads that can tolerate this kind of deferral. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, the cartoon version of this that you, what you want to accomplish is here where, you know, there's some workload, the blue here is the workload in terms of energy utilization. Uh, the green would be solar. Uh, and this is actually real workload uh, shown from an HP data center uh, in the Bay Area. And you know, there the solar plot is a typical day or a one example day of the PV capacity that they have on their roof. Uh, and so you want to take you know the figure on the left uh, and adapt the workload so that it looks like the figure on the right as much as possible. Uh, and so you know this is this is the challenge. But of course, uh, you can't predict what the solar is going to look like. And switching costs are crucial here because if you're switching a server off and on all the time. Uh, you're really impacting its longevity. The wear and tear costs are quite significant. And if you kind of put them in the same scale, switching a server off and on or into a deep power saving mode and back once is uh, sort of equivalent in cost to running it for about three hours. Uh, and so you have to be willing to leave the server off for quite a while 
if you're going to switch it off. Otherwise, you're going to eat up the cost and wear and tear that you're saving in terms of energy. Uh, and so you really do have to pay attention to these switching costs when you're making the decisions. And so this was what motivated to work on it. Our, our initial work was, you know, uh, along those lines and used predictions uh, because they had some predictions of the renewable things and we got it implemented. And it was, as, as BJ mentioned in the introduction, it was a very uh, rewarding experience because the algorithms actually ported over and they worked in practice and they were deployed and there was, you know, there's products now that use that sort of uh, work that algorithmic framework to, to do this in lots of data centers uh, now among lots of different companies. Um, and that, so that was our start. And then after that, there's really been a lot of uh, use of models like this in a lot in many different cases of energy. Uh, so smart grid type work. So you can use this for demand response to data centers, for electric vehicle charging. We have actually a test bed on Caltech's campus that Stephen Lowe runs and a couple of our, our co-advised students work in. Uh, and you know, there the idea is to manage the dynamically manage the charging rates of electric vehicles and you know this way of deferring load to match what's available in terms of renewable energy. And, and it's again uh, a smooth online optimization problem that guides the way these algorithms work. Uh, the, the deployed algorithms work and there's a startup now that's uh, doing, taking this out much more broadly than the Caltech campus. Uh, and so you can look at a lot of different places where this is core and it's not just energy. So there's a number of groups at Caltech and beyond that are using this for uh, very different applications. Uh, a couple of my favorites are Yisung Yu's work uh, on facial animation and robotic planning. Uh, so you can imagine the, you know, if you're doing animation for, you know, uh, uh, movies or TV shows, uh, animating the mouth is a very hard thing. Uh, but phonically, you know what position the mouth should be in for each sound that's coming out of it, but you want it to move smooth, smoothly from one shape to another shape. And so you have the kind of hitting cost as matching the shape that it should be for the sound that's happening now, but a smoothing cost to make sure it's not a jerky movement from one uh, shape to another as you, as you do the speaking. And robotic planning similarly. So, uh, uh, Yu Song's work on that is, is now actually being used by the NBA, by Disney. Uh, and you can imagine a robotic camera. And you know, if you're filming an NBA game, you want the ball in the center of the screen, but you don't want the camera to be jerking everywhere the ball goes as it bounces around. You want the camera to move smoothly. And so again, you have a hitting cost where, for where the ball is in the frame, and you have a smoothing cost to make sure there's not jerkiness in the camera work. And there's lots of other examples too. One that we're one that we're working actively on now is around uh, drone planning, so uh, drone swarms. And this is a cartoon version of what it would look like in this case. But you can imagine a like high-level motion planning problem for drones, being that you have some tracking, some trajectory that you're going to track data, uh, and your action is your x, uh, your say your altitude, how and your right, it's multi-dimensional. But think of like uh, you know your position. Uh, I guess I should say not just altitude. Uh, and now, so you're trying to track the trajectory as your hitting cost, but your smoothing cost is making sure that you're not trying to jerkily move in lots of different directions all the time. You want to move smoothly uh, through the trajectory. Uh, and so, you know, this is this is one version of that. And, and there's now been a number of groups that have used SoCo versions of uh, drone tracking uh, for real world implementations. So all these different applications means there's lots of variations of the model people have looked at. You don't have to just have a simple action space that's a, you know, uh, a box set or anything. You can have ramping constraints, storage constraints, uh, things like this. Uh, you can have cost functions that have uh, lots of different forms. You can have switching costs that are norms or Bregman divergence or even, you know, other things that you might imagine. Uh, and there's lots of papers with lots of different variations like this that have been looking at them because of specific applications that people are interested in. Um, but, you know, for this talk, the interesting thing is to try to connect this with control. And, you know, at this point, it should be mysterious why there is a connection to control because control has dynamics and there's no dynamics here. There's no state, uh, there's just an action. Uh, so we need to think about state and dynamics if we're going to make this connection. And, and just, you know, coming back to the drone example to make that really clear, right, there's dynamics going on in the there where you're choosing your acceleration and that acceleration impacts your position and uh, your velocity and your position and all of this. And the dynamics are really how you're interacting with the system. And so you have a control action that you have to make that, you know, that is goes through the dynamics to determine your position. You can't just choose your position directly. Uh, and so, you know, having that dynamics is crucial 
Uh, and it's not clear how you get that from SOCO as I've stated it so far, if we want to connect this to control. Uh, and so, you know, more generally, you can think of, you know, a linear dynamical system as, you know, having some sort of dynamics uh, like this. Uh, and, you know, yes, the objective, here's a simple quadratic one, but the objective kind of matches what's going on with SOCO, but why is the dynamics connection to here? Uh, and so this is something that, you know, for a long time, we believed there was a deep connection between these two things. And just very recently, uh, we have been making progress in kind of uncovering this connection. Uh, and so there's a series of kind of four papers where, you know, the first one, we had a very weak connection to control. Uh, the second one, the con connection got a little stronger. The third one, it got a little stronger. And finally, in, in some really ongoing work that is, is not yet submitted, we, we have a result that I think makes the connection very crisp. And so this, this is the sort of the culmination of, of quite a number of papers uh, where we can now prove a reduction between these two problems, between the control of uh, a linear dynamical system and SOCO, where basically, you know, give us a, an LDS with, you know, A and B in canonical form, then I can give you an equivalent online convex optimization problem with switching costs, uh, where, you know, if I saw, if you give me an algorithm that solves the online optimization problem with some guarantee, I get uh, a policy for the LDS with that same guarantee. Uh, now, we, the reason why it took so long is, is the SOCO problem I've given you so far isn't quite enough uh, to make that connection. You have to look at an online optimization problem with memory and delay added to it. Uh, and so it, ha it has to be a little bit more complicated uh, than what I've described. And, and what I mean by memory is the switching costs have to depend not just on your previous action, but on your K previous action. Uh, because you know, because of the dynamics, you can't just move from one step to another instantaneously. It takes it might take time to get there. Uh, the dynamics will control how you can get there. So you have to have a switching cost that kind of embeds that dependency, uh, and so it has to be able to depend on more than just one step. And similarly, you may not be able to observe the uh, cost right away. There might be delayed feedback as a result of the dynamics. Like you know, you're choosing your action, it takes a while for it to be to get to the action you want. And because of that delay, you're not getting feedback on your action right away. Uh, and so memory and delay are crucial to making this reduction. Uh, and so, you know, really concretely what that means is, you know, suppose this is coming back to my cartoon, suppose you're choosing XT uh, and you were just recently at XT minus one, you know, you, these were your previous actions. Uh, you're given a hitting cost, you're making an action, you're observing some cost on that hitting cost. To make it a little simpler, think of there being, think of this as like a tracking cost. So there's some V of T, which is the minimizer, and the cost depends on how far away you are from that minimizer. Um, so think of the cost function as something like that. Now, delay is basically saying that V of T is not revealed to you until K steps later. So you, you know the functional form of the tracking objective but you don't know the point that you were supposed to be tracking until a delay of K. So that's what I mean by delay. And for memory, what I mean is that the switching cost depends on not just XT minus one and XT, but all the way back to XT minus P for some memory of length P. Uh, and in general, you could have an arbitrary cost function that the connection to control uses this specific form of memory where there is a structure to it where you depend linearly uh, on the previous t minus p, uh, or t minus p memory, uh, up to t minus one, t minus two, t minus p uh, actions. So this is this form is you know you you would hope to be able to you know study OCO with general memory, but this is the form of memory that we use in our reduction uh, to control. And so you know this just makes the problem that I described to you previously all that harder, all that much harder because now you're trying to decide whether to switch without knowing the future, but you don't even get to observe your cost until later and your k previous costs or steps actions are affecting your current cost so uh you have a lot of you know a lot of choices affect your current cost and you don't get to see what that experiential uh, version of the cost is until later and so that's that's the version of the problem that we can connect directly to lds control and there in the reduction, you know, it's, it's a complex reduction, but uh, in the reduction, something that comes out is that uh, memory 
at least in the way we're doing it, memory connects to input disturbances. So, you know, the, the disturbance being connected to the B uh, in the linear dynamical system. And uh, delay is what kind of is, allows us to capture the, the noise in the state. So delay is kind of connected to state disturbance. Memory is corresponding to input disturbance. And that's why I put both of these citations up here. This first one is gonna appear in NeurIPS this year and it looks at input disturbance. And it's only very recently that we figured out how to do delay disturbances or to state do delay and state disturbances. Um, so our, this is a good point to take questions on this reduction before I give you an algorithm. Next, the rest of the talk will be giving you an algorithm for this. I have a question regarding this reduction. Yeah. You seem, you seem to, in the previous slide, you seem to be talking about the action space, but are actually you're, you're denoting as X. So is it the action space or is it the state space? Ah, uh, yeah, so th thank you. This is the first time I'm giving this talk and this is something that I should emphasize. So, so here I'm drawing a picture of the OCO, of the online optimization problem. Uh, and the online optimization problem is uh, the X is the action in the action space. Uh, I, I, I like to frame it that way because you know, when you look back at, uh, let me come back here a little bit. When you look back at the linear dynamical, uh, the LDLDS, you're choosing the U, but it's the X is still the thing that impacts the hitting cost. Uh, so, right, if we look here, X is still playing kind of the same role here. And the U is sort of being, you know, basically transforming the U into a switching cost in terms of the state is what the reduction is doing. And so it still is kind of natural to think of the X as being the action. It's just being controlled indirectly by you. Uh, and, you know, because of the reduction, that, that's still kind of the way we use about it. But the cartoon was, was OCO, and that's why I was using X as the action. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Actually, the, I, uh, the question was, um, because you have this uh, model where you said that your memory is up to P. And so I was wondering if the memory is up to P on the action, how can you take care of autoregressive, uh, uh, simple autoregressive models, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so and that, I mean, that's a great question. So, so here, this is, this is all in the OCO space and uh, you know, everything is adversarial. And so, you know, the guarantees we're looking about have to hold for any costs you might you might get in that in that context and so got it thank you very much yeah okay awesome so so going forward then that's that my my goal there was one more question oh, which is basically go for it. Yeah. yeah it was just saying how does p depend on the problem do you i mean is it i guess it's in each problem you have a different p in some sense. yeah yeah so that's just the the lds whatever lds you care about uh you know that defines your p um uh, okay, so so that was hopefully motivating why do, why I care about online optimization and this idea now that if we can understand online optimization, you know, the SOCO model, if we can give an algorithm for that, by default we get a competitive control algorithm, and and this is powerful because you know understanding control, you typically try to do well compared to the best linear controller. If we can get a competitive control policy, we're actually doing well compared to the best possible, even potentially nonlinear controller uh, for that LDS. And so we get a very strong, robust guarantee if we can you know, prove an algorithm in online optimization. Okay, and so now, uh, I, this is the first time I've given this talk, and so I'm worried about being long. Uh, yeah, I'm long, aren't I? Um, the, uh, I want to do a little bit of a warm up here, but maybe I should actually skip this uh, because it's already 1:45. So, so this I'm going to skip over this warm up because this uh, is sort of is meant to kind of highlight what's hard uh, about the problem. But uh, I think from the questions, it seems like people uh, understand that this is a hard problem already. So our goal, our goal at this point is to uh, go after developing an algorithm that can be constant competitive, uh, and you know the. The motivation for this is, you know, that, you know, that's just a very strong guarantee. It's compared to the online optimal. And, and as, you know, the question's already said, you know, if we're, if we're looking at regret, there's ways of connecting this and there's been a lot of work on regret, but competitive ratio is a harder guarantee and there hasn't been as much work there. And so, you know, long time ago, the initial answer to this was yes, in the sense that, uh, you know, this was our first result in this area. And, you know, we could give a competitive policy, but only in the case of one dimension. 
so the one dimensional version of the problem, we could be three competitive. And, you know, at the time we were feeling like really good about ourselves. That was a good win. Uh, you know, for a long time, people thought about trying to improve it. Can you do better than the three? Uh, you can, you can get to a two and you can show that two is the best possible, but those are very complex algorithms. You can get the three again with a memoryless algorithm if you want. And so there was a long sequence of work trying to kind of improve things and understand things in one dimension. Uh, but for, you know, many years, there was basically no progress outside of one dimension, uh, unless you were making use of uh, predictions or stochastic assumptions on the cost functions or things like that. Uh, and, you know, very recently, just, uh, you know, a year or so ago, uh, people, you know, this year is when it was published, so a year or so ago, we figured out why. Uh, in some sense, you can't. So, you know, in a high dimensional version of the problem, so in a d-dimensional problem, there's a specific problem called convex body chasing, which is an example that I'll describe in a second. Uh, you can prove that you can never do better than a root d competitive ratio. So the uh, guarantee is going to get worse as you go to high dimensions. Uh, and this holds even if you can perfectly forecast uh, any constant w steps ahead. So even if you have predictions of w steps ahead, you still can't be constant so competitive in a sense that it's dimension free. So this would, you know, very much limit you in terms of applying this stuff to high dimensional problems and, and the world is high dimensional. Uh, and so I want to just give a high level idea of convex body chasing because this is a great example to think about why uh, this problem is hard. So in convex body chasing, it's very much like before. You're starting from a, you know, point, but now instead of giving a cost function, there's just a body that shows up and you always have to be inside the body. So you're going to choose some point inside that body. You're going to pay only your cost. It, you know, you don't have a, you don't have a hitting cost anymore because you just care about being in the body, but you pay your movement cost, your switching cost. And so then you get a new body and so on, you get a new body and so on. And again, you're trying to decide where to move without knowing the future. And here we moved around a lot in this example. If we had just moved to here and then here and then here, we would have been able to move very little. Uh, and still be in all three bodies. Uh, and so, you know, there's this idea again that if you don't know the future, how can you possibly do well here? Because the adversary can give you bodies that really mess you up. Uh, and, you know, it's easy to see that a SOCO generalizes convex body chasing because you just take your body and you give yourself, you know, hard ends where the cost is zero in the body and infinite outside the body. And you know you're you're calling you're you're capturing the convex body chasing. The things that's more surprising is you can actually go the other way too. So if you can give a constant competitive convex body chasing algorithm, you'll have a con constant competitive online optimization instance too. And this is a little bit harder, but the reduction basically goes as you'd expect. You turn a body out of the cost functions, but then you force yourself to jump back down to the uh, x-axis in between. So jump back down to the axis in between uh, so that you have that cost to move up into the function which captures the hitting cost. Uh, and so this was proven by uh, Sebastian Bubeck's group uh, just a couple of years ago. But it's interesting because you get a constant competitive uh, that differs by one dimension. So if you have a constant competitive algorithm for d dimensions in convex body chasing, you get one for d minus one dimensions uh, in SOCO. And that's important because when we think about what's known for convex body chasing, the only place where constant competitive algorithms exist is for two dimensions, which then via the reduction gives you a constant competitive algorithm for one dimension in SOCO, which is what we already knew. Uh, and then when you look more generally, there's been a lot of work by Sebastian Bubek's group and uh, Anupam Gupta's group and others, uh, and Nikhil Bantal as well, um, over the last few years in the theoretical computer science, the stock box type community. Uh, culminating in a paper this year where they give a algorithm that depends linearly on the dimensionality of the problem. Uh, and so they're not matching our lower bound of root D, uh, but it's, you know, again, you know, not bad. And so uh, the idea here is, you know, you can't do this well in general because, you know, body, you know, cost functions that are very steep cause you problems. Uh, and so you need to make some assumptions uh, and so you need sort of some sort of smoothness or, you know, convexity like type of guarantees uh, to be able to get a positive result. Uh, and so motivated by that, that's what we started to go after. Uh, and it turns out you can do well once you have this little structure. And so this is a result for just over a year ago now, uh, where 
what you can prove is you can give a dimension free competitive ratio with an algorithm that I'll describe in a second, uh, where the competitive ratio depends on the, you know, the parameter of convexity. It's for M strong convex functions, uh, you get a one over root M guarantee. And so this highlights that kind of as the function becomes more flat, the M becomes uh, smaller. And so the competitive ratio blows up. Uh, and so that's that sort of surfer flat function is the worst case. But as you have some, you know, convexity as M becomes a little larger, you get very good uh, constant competitive bounds that don't depend on the uh, dimensionality of the problem at all here. And, you know, I think, you know, this was really exciting to us. I mean, I, we had been thinking about this. I had been thinking about this for a long time. And, you know, this felt like a breakthrough to me at the time when we figured it out. Uh, and it gets better because, you know, it's not only not dependent on D, but we can prove a lower bound. Uh, and it's the lower bound shows that we're in the right order. But not only are we in the right order, but the competitive ratio matches the lower bound on any online algorithm precisely, including all constants. And so really, you can't have an online algorithm with a better guarantee than what this algorithm does, our ROBD. And so I'll, I'll now explain what it is. Hopefully, that motivates you to be curious about what it is. Uh, it's, I'll start with just OBD, because uh, that's where we started to. Our first paper was just looking at online balanced descent. Uh, and this is a, a nice kind of uh, adjustment to gradient type algorithms. So, so the idea here is you know, gradient descent is what you might think of first. For, as a way to approach a problem like this. And so if we think of our cost function here, this is, this is what I'm drawing. I have like the minimizer of the cost function here. These are all the level curves. You're sitting on some level curve out here. Gradient descent, you would move you know, perpendicularly to the level curve where you are and take a step. But if you do that and you end up on, say, you know, this level curve, uh, there was a cheaper way to get there and pay the same cost. Everywhere on that level curve it has the same hitting cost. So you should move there in the quickest way possible, because then you're minimizing both, you're, you're minimizing your switching cost while having the same hitting cost as somewhere else on that level curve. Uh, and so kind of intuitively, this is, this is one of the key ideas of the algorithm, which is don't move in a perpendicular way to where you are, move in a perpendicular way to where you'll land. So that's the first key idea in the algorithm. And the second one is to be balanced in choosing the level set where you land. So choose the level set in a way that balances the hitting cost and the switching cost. <clears throat> and so here, basically what you do is you're, you're gonna do a projection onto a level set uh, instead of moving you know, orthogonally from where you are. Uh, and then you're gonna choose that level set to balance the switching cost here. So or sorry, this, this is the hitting cost, the beta times the L, with the switching cost, how much you're moving. And so if you choose those to be balanced, that selects a level set and then project onto that level set. And so this is the, the idea in online balanced descent. It's not quite enough. So we were able to prove basically that this gets you to a, a, you know, an M to the negative two thirds uh, competitive ratio, but we were able to get to the M to the negative one half with the optimal one. So there's one more idea uh, that's needed. And that idea is to be more greedy. So basically this balanced approach isn't quite greedy enough. And so you need to do one other thing. You need to go from where you end with what I've described so far and take a step directly at the minimizer. Note, this is again different than what gradient descent would do because you're not moving orthogonally to the level set where you are. You're just moving greedily according to the global properties of the cost function directly at the minimizer. And so you're you know, going from this thing where you depended on the intermediate geometry to get to this level set to one where you're just pretending you can get all the way to the minimizer, but taking a step of some size towards there. And then the size of the step you take towards there depends on the convexity of the function. Um, so those two things combined get you to that optimal uh, competitive ratio. And it would be hard to do this computationally as I've described it so far, but you can show that that's equivalent to uh, solving this kind of regularized optimization problem at each step. And so you can implement this by basically implementing the solution to this regularized optimizer, this regularizer uh, problem here. And I won't go into why they're equivalent, but it's not hard to see that they're equivalent. And so that gives you regularized automatic balance ascent. It's computationally simple, uh, and it obtains the optimal competitive ratio for uh, you know this type of problem, uh, the optimal that could be achieved by any online algorithm. Uh, and so so that's I think a pretty interesting new algorithm. We haven't seen an algorithm of that front. Uh, and we can go even further because so far I've ignored delay in memory. 
so how do we handle delay in memory? Uh, well, it makes things worse, uh, but you can still get a constant dimension free algorithm even with uh, delay in memory. Uh, the, the bound becomes a little bit more complicated here. So here K is the delay. So you can see it's, it's kind of exponential in the delay. And the memory is captured by this thing here, which captures, if you remember, there was that little, there was that linear form uh, of the structured switching costs. And so this captures kind of the, the weight of the impact of the switching costs, uh, of the switching costs over the history. And so you can see the alpha showing up in a few places and the K showing up there. Um, but the interesting thing here is this gives us a constant dimension free competitive ratio by the reduction. This gives us a constant competitive ratio for the any linear dynamical system. Uh, and you can you can sort of view this at, like, for example, in that low level tracking problem and get something that looks like uh, the basically the convexity parameters L and M. Uh, so L smooth M strongly convex to the K where K is the delay that you have uh, in the problem. Uh, and so delay hurts you a lot. Memory doesn't hurt you very much. And if you remember, delay corresponds to state disturbances. So state disturbances are somehow hard to take care of when we think of competitive ratio, whereas input disturbances don't actually hurt us that much when it comes to competitive ratio, which is, I think, an interesting insight that comes this from, from this. Of course, that could be dependent on the way we did our reduction, but it, it seems to be a fairly general effect, I'd say. Um, OK, and so I. I want to say just a brief thing about how we extend here. So it's, it's still using ROBD as the idea, but now we're being optimistic uh, in our uh, approach to ROBD because we don't have all the information, right? We don't have the cost functions anymore. So how do we, how do we implement ROBD without the detailed information on the geometry of the cost function that we used in the previous thing? And so here, the way to think about it is, you know, if, we've made, if we've made these steps, these are our actions, but we have delay three, then then up to three steps ago, up to time t minus four, we have all the information. We can compute what ROBD would have been doing. And so up to that point, we know where ROBD would have been. From that point, we don't know. So although you know, we just started a new round, so we just got a new piece of information, so we can compute one more step of what ROBD would have done. But then after that, what we do is we pretend to run ROBD but we run it in an optimistic way. And what I mean by that is we run it on cost functions that would be the best for us. So we kind of pretend we're going to see cost functions that are good for us, pretend we're going to see cost functions that would minimize our cost. So we solve a, a minimization function over what cost functions could come in the next three steps, in this case, because delay is three. Uh, and we choose the cost functions that are minimizing the cost ROBD would experience. And then we run ROBD as if those were the real costs. And what we end up at as our XT in this hypothesized estimated trajectory is what we choose as our round. So this is really like a kind of a strange thing. You're optimistically, you're, you're pretending the world is gonna give you the best case cost functions going forward. And by doing that, you're optimizing the worst case bound, which is a little counterintuitive, I think, but it turns out to work. Um, and so, it, you know, again, the next step, you would do the same thing. You would get one more piece of information. You compute one more step of what ROBD would have done with real information. And then you hypothesize what it would be done if instead of an adversary, you had a really nice person out there giving the cost functions that would make the world as good as possible for you. Uh, and then you run that step to get there uh, and go on. And so that's the algorithm that's optimistic ROBD. Uh, let me pause there and ask if there are questions about the algorithms. I have one quick question. Like, yeah. why does optimistic cost function make you move at all? Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, so it, in some cases it wouldn't, uh, but remember you, you're depending on memory. And so unless you have been still all the way up until the green part ended, moving might actually help you, right? So the cost functions might wanna move to be moving back to where that kind of middle of what you've done <laughs> has been. And mm -hmm. so the memory is what makes it so you might want to move basically. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions on the algorithm? Okay. No, so I'm, I'm basically done. Let me just wrap up. So, so the, the, you know, the nice thing here is I showed it with delay in memory. You can actually get an extension of this. We haven't done memory in non-convex case, but you can extend these ideas uh, to non-convex cost functions 
with some assumptions on non-convexity. Uh, and you can extend it to predictions where you have information about future cost functions that are coming as opposed to delayed information about cost functions that are coming. Uh, and so there's a lot of other stuff. Uh, and then, you know, I was going to do one. Yeah, maybe I'll say just quickly because I think it's super, super cute. So there's a there's a nice application of this stuff that feels kind of out of thin air where uh, we've also been able to prove a reduction that shows that online optimization algorithms can be converted into distributed optimization algorithms. So if you give me an online optimization algorithm with a competitive ratio, then I can give you a distributed local optimization algorithm where you know a bunch of distributed agents are computing a uh, global optimal without with limited communication. And the, the what you get out of that is a you know bound uh, an algorithm with the same approximation ratio as the competitive ratio was and that uses only logarithmic number of messages. And this is really exciting because you know it means that you're beating by an order of magnitude the number of messages that are required uh, by things like ADMM. Uh, but you know it's it's not replacing ADMM in any means because you're getting one algorithm, so one approximation bound. If you want to make it perfect, if you want to make the error go to zero, you can't do this with approach with this approach because you're just getting this specific competitive ratio out. But if you don't care about the error going to zero, you just care about the error being good enough. This lets you get an exponential improvement in the messages you require to do that distributed optimization. Um, Okay, so with that, I'll end and I'll just say, you know, in terms of online optimization, there's been huge progress in the last few years. I talked about the case with no predictions. There's, uh, you know, lots of, there's a similar trajectory of improvements where you have predictions available. There have been lots of applications of this stuff. There's still a lot of open questions that, that many groups are working on. Uh, and I'm, I'm really excited about the fact that the connection between online optimization and control is feeling more and more tangible. Uh, with each year that goes past. And, and I think it can be deepened quite a bit more. I, I really think that there is a, a connection between online optimization and control, not just in linear, simple linear dynamical systems, but in, in much more general, uh, much more generality, where we can start to understand how competitive control is possible and where it's possible by studying online optimization algorithms. So thank you and sorry for running so long. I appreciate well, you. Thanks a lot, Adam. So I think I'm going to take over now. If you just uh, you can, if you want to stop sharing, so okay. I'm the discussant. So perfect. I'll stop sharing right now. Uh, so I can share a screen, and I need to share my okay. share. Share. So yeah, I just had a few, oops, sorry, let me turn this one on. There we go. Yeah, sorry, working with too many uh, interfaces is a problem. Uh, yes. So I had a few questions based on the, the papers that you had sent that uh, these talks were, I know you, you made, uh, made it to, what, what happened now? Yeah, sorry, I didn't make so it to the, the first thing was sort of um, a lot of it. If, the way I was reading the paper, I mean, I think I sort of we talked about this a little bit too. Uh, these <clears throat> your core assumptions in the adversary, either in the convex setting, is basically some smoothness constraints, um, or in the non-convex setting, the cost functions related to switching costs. So, in some sense, can these constraints be interpreted in the robust control context? I know you had a reduction going from, um, in some sense, using the going from using the online convex optimization to linear dynamic or dynamical systems. Is it possible to go the other way around? In some sense, um, uh, and there is a, as you were saying, there's a large history there. Is there a way to take all that is known there in the edge infinity context and see uh, how that will transfer? I have very limited knowledge about this, but um, so that was sort of one question that I had uh, looking at the kind of um, the way you approach the problem. So if I go further, um, so you know, you just mentioned it briefly on this nonlinear switching costs or nonlinear costs as well. Uh, there, if I remember the algorithm, you need to solve the problem exactly. Can approximate solutions suffice? Because I guess non-convex non optimized, so actually non-convex is what I meant to say here. Non-convex um, optimization problems are hard to solve. And uh, one of the algorithms that you present in the paper is there, which basically does a, a deterministic sort of horizon control thing that seem to rely on using 
uh, switching costs, which were quadratic. Um, can that be generalized because of the nice relationships between quadratic costs and Bregman divergences? Can that be generalized to Bregman divergences? I feel you sort of addressed it here with the, the projection idea, so they are very related. So I, I suppose that should uh, hold. But nevertheless, that's a question I had. The last thing is something you never talked about. Um, I, I know it's in one of the, um, the papers that you had, was randomization in these algorithms. So all of these algorithms that you had were not randomized at all. They were basically deterministic algorithms. Um, however, in the literature, based on what I read from your paper, was that randomized, uh, randomization does not help in the OCO context, but it's necessary with non-convex context. Is there some way to, I mean, intuitively, why does this happen? Is there a simple way people can understand that? Or, um, or is there an alternative explanation than just a technical one? Is there some deep, deeper philosophical connection? Um, so yeah. the kind you have in other problems. Hmm. Yeah, these are, these are great. The last ones. thing in some sense is the, the way the randomization is used and the adversary knows it or not, uh, how should one think of it? It didn't seem to me too similar to mixed strategies in game theory. Um, is it something different? Uh, is it worth looking at the game theoretic idea of the common, um, common knowledge and rationality or do you think that's not the right approach in this problem? So I will, uh, stop my sharing with there and I'll let you. I'll leave, leave your sharing because then I can remember the questions. Uh, <laughs> if you leave your sharing, then I can remember the questions. I, I think, you know, the maybe going in reverse order because that's the order I remember them. I, I really like the, you know, the, the question about randomization is really interesting. And, you know, in the, in the convex case, it was kind of proven early on that randomization couldn't help. Uh, in the non-convex case, it's really not clear. So we have basically there's one paper, we have one paper uh, that looks at the non-convex case at this point, and we needed randomization to get around the adversary. Uh, and it's kind of easy to see why. If you if you kind of imagine a you know simple function that has you know two minima that are very close to each other, two local minima that are very close to each other in cost. Uh, do you, if the adversary gives you one of those, whichever minima you choose to be by, uh, it'll just, after that point, make the other one the minima and you have to take a big switching cost and the adversary knew that that was gonna be the next one that came and so it avoids that. And so, you know, randomization basically allows you to randomize that selection among local minima and avoid the uh, issues that the adversary could force you to if you were deterministic there. And so I, I think it's necessary to do well, uh, but we haven't proven that. Uh, it might be that some there would be some way or some assumptions that one could make to avoid the need for randomization in that context. But I, you know, I think that simple example highlights that in some sense, you either need to come up with some new assumptions or, uh, or use randomization to do well. Uh, and I, I do think it's a lot like the, you know, the mixed strategy in, you know, in game theory. And so there's a, there's, you know, in OCO, there's a strong connection between, uh, you know, games and regret, you know, min regret policies and, and online optimization. And I would expect that that sort of connection could be developed in the non-convex world too, but I haven't seen anybody do that. I think that would be an interesting direction to go. The, the non-convex versions of these are still wide open as, as far as I'm concerned. Um, yeah, so, so that was over to the, no, the, no, the non-convex case. In the, in the case of connections to robust control, uh, I think that's really interesting to explore. We, we really haven't, we've been one way in this. So we have expertise in OCO and we've been taking that and trying to use it in control. Uh, I think it would be really interesting to see what kind of control problems or what sort of online optimization problems can be just attacked with control coming the other direction. Uh, I don't think there has been as much there. I, it, you know, it's interesting. Our, our reduction would say that in some sense there are, there are problems like uh, convex body chasing that are just different than what shows up in control, but there's certainly going to be a class of online optimization problems that are very alike, uh, have a lot of the same challenges that you have in control. And so, you know, it would be nice to go back and forth there. Um, and I forget the middle set of questions. Uh, that was more about the non-convex uh, switching cost, uh, non-convex yeah. cost, where do you have to solve problems exactly or not? That's right. Yeah, and so I didn't emphasize this in the talk very much, but I'll, some of our results really do require quadratic switching costs, like L2 squared switching, switching costs. Uh, others don't. Uh, where Typically, where we... Uh, 
you know, have an L2 uh, limitation there. It, it depends on, you know, properties of the quadratic. And so the generalizations that are possible are exactly what you're, what you're predicting to Bregman divergence, because, you know, there that's sort of, you know, a natural generalization of the properties that you use for quadratics in these proofs. And so uh, in a number of cases, we've been able to do that. I, I, we haven't done it in the non-convex case, but I expect that it should be possible. Uh, it's just not something we've uh, gone down the road of yet. Uh, but I think and, you know, well, do you have to idea. solve these non-convex problems exactly, or do you think uh, like some approximation? Yeah, so that that's a great question. So we we've uh, in in our version right now, we assume that you have some oracle that solves them exactly. Uh, the results should easily extend to either additive or multiplicative uh, approximate solvers, but we're we kind of intentionally left that as something separate. So we focused on the online version of the problem and whatever solution. So if you're using some neural net to approximate it in a given round, uh, then as long as that approximation is good, then you know the error in that approximation just gets added on top of the error in the competitive ratio uh, to be able to get the guarantee. Yeah. That's great. Well, thanks so much for answering the question and taking. So let me just ask if anyone else has any questions here before um, we sort of end the seminar. Yeah. So someone said there's basically, there's a lot of work on, yeah, I guess Vin Hu and actually Pete Seiler who's another colleague in control. They've been sort of converting optimization problems to linear dynamical systems and using robust control to study the convergence. I guess you're looking at the other direction is, and, and the question was, is there a, a, a more concrete theory that goes back and forth? It's not, you know. Yeah, that's a great thing. I, I know some of that work. I don't know all of it. A lot of what, there, you know, of course, optimization has been really powerful in control. Uh, and so, you know, here we're kind of looking more at this, this specific online learning problem. And so I think we get a little bit of a different sense of the algorithms that come out uh, as a result. But, but I, there, there's definitely connections uh, between the two. Yeah. So if there are no other questions, let's thank uh, Adam again. Thank you very much for a great talk. Oh, and, I heard a voice. Is oh, there sorry. a name? I have a quick question. I don't know if we have time. No, I yes. was curious. So go ahead. I was curious in doing OC, online convex optimization for a linear system. Yeah. Are there instance specific things that pop up in complexity results? like? Can you say anything about my AB and properties about that that would make this a better algorithm or a worse algorithm? Yeah, so we're, we're, this is so new that I don't have a crisp answer to that yet, but uh, you know, my answer is going to be vague uh, but revealing. So yes, uh, there should be, and the way we're trying to formulate that is to you know the representation in canonical form. So so our reduction really is, relies on starting in uh, with uh, you know A and B in canonical form, and so the you know basically there's a mapping between you know regions of the canonical form and the uh, and the uh, re, you know the optimization problem through the reduction. And so we're we're right now basically playing with different ways of making that crisp in, in terms of what leads to the competitive ratio being larger or smaller, but we don't have a crisp statement of it yet. But there's like just following, you know, the notation through, it's clear that there is a connection. It's just how do you get intuition from it? And we just don't have that yet. So hopefully we'll have that as we write it up in the next couple of weeks. Thanks. All right, if there are no other, connect, no other questions. Let's thank Adam again. Thanks again for the summary. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thanks for the attention and the questions. It was fun. And anybody who has questions or wants to follow, please just email me. And I know I'm meeting with some people tomorrow, but I'm also happy to have other meetings. Just send me a note. Great. Thanks. See you. See you.